light shine. We can be thankful that we have a light to shine, so praise the Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of the service, Lord, I just pray, Lord, as we look into your word, Lord, that you would have your way with this vessel of clay. Lord, we are ever so thankful, Lord, for all the things you've brought to us in this hour. And Lord, we are ever so thankful that you got your hand upon each and every one of us. Now in Christ Jesus' name I pray, amen. We see it this morning. morning, if you want to turn with me to uh, Ezekiel chapter, the 39th chapter. There's a couple of things that's in the book of Ezekiel, which is the, we know that's that war before the week of Daniel. But there's two scriptures that I want to dwell upon this morning that Ezekiel 39, the 39th uh, ninth chapter, has a couple of things that identify when this war is and what are the effects that God has in it for a time frame. And one of the scriptures that you'll find, and this is nothing new because it's been revealed a long while back. But when we go down to the 12th verse, it's after that war has finished. That's that war that would be just prior to the opening of that seventh seal. And it states here in the 12th verse that it says, And they shall, sorry, and seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them that they may cleanse the land. Just that simple verse alone. To those of the denominational world that puts Ezekiel 38, 39 as Armageddon, that blows it out of the water. Because when the day when Armageddon comes around, no sooner than its end, then you have the Lord coming, and the dead are not going to be buried to begin with. It talks about how the saints will wash, will walk on the ashes of the wicked. So therefore, in order for this to be in its rightful place, somewhere before the week of Daniel. There has to be a time frame where Israel will be burying the dead that's in the land to begin with. That's one thing that's important in the sense of looking, yes, we know there's that war of Ezekiel 38 and 39. And some say, well, it's not 38, 39. Well, it both comely, comely, com climaxes into that same thought. Now, the other one is found in verse 9. And they shall... And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrow, and the half stays and the spears, and they, sh they shall burn them for seven years. Now there's two things that helps identify, and it is going to be related to what we're going to talk in this message about those seven years that Israel is burning the weapons. We know that according to the religious world, they put, Arme, they put Ezekiel 38 and 39 here at the end of the week. When that week ends, and after the week is, is over, then there's the day of the Lord that's coming. It would be utterly impossible for Israel while the Lord is coming to destroy the sinners from the face of the earth, 
to be occupied by cleaning the land by burning the weapons. So that's an impossibility. So that clears, there's two, these two statements clears Ezekiel 38 and 39 that it is not at the end of the week of Daniel, but it has to be somewhere prior where they would have time to bury the dead, which identifies it can't be Ezekiel, it can't be Armageddon, plus the burning of the weapons for seven years, it can't be at Armageddon because you have the day of the Lord that's coming right upon them. Now, I know that uh, in the things I've been looking for the last while, last six months or so, we looked at, well, might as well go through there. We looked at the half hour silence. So I called it the time frame for, we were looking at time in the half hour silence. And I can see in the movement there was kind of nervousness. Well, half hour silence is, is a half hour, it's not long. Well, there's two things involved with this half hour silence. First of all, I'm gonna start referring it to the seventh seal time factor, which would be a time factor shows you a relative time. In that time factor, when Jesus comes off that mercy seat and peels that seventh seal, while all the saints for 2,000 years have been watching him sit on the throne, there he is as high priest, dealing with salvation for mankind, especially for calling the bride. And he's been sitting on there, hasn't been moving from that position, but now he gets up and he takes the book and he opened, yes, six seals in 1963. But we're more concerned about what he's doing when he opens that seventh seal. When he opens the seventh seal, all heaven is hushed. Something has changed. Something is different now. And yes, for the heavenly crowd, for a moment, it could, let's, I know I've heard a message of Brother Jackson saying, not that I'm relying on what Brother Jackson says, but it is, we can look at it in two respects this morning. In as those in heaven, it will hush them up for, people can be hushed up for a half hour. Because if you're seeing something, you're all amazed. That's one aspect of it. That's aspect to an individual. When we talk about one hour or so forth, when he talks about, you're talking about it's a relative time frame in not even years, but it talks about in that short time frame. But when we're talking about the event that's happening in that half hour time silence, it also refers to a time factor of that seventh seal being opened. And when it's, there's things that's going to happen, and when that seventh seal is open, first of all, the angel of Revelation chapter 10 comes down. But before he can come down, there's little things that we sometimes, we see and we don't see. When we look at Revelation chapter 5, and maybe I've got it here. Is that big enough for you to read or? Well, you got your Bibles anyway. When we arrive at verse nine in, the, in chapter five of the book of Revelation, they sang a new song and saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open it, to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongues, peoples, and nations. So here he's showing worthy to do it. And he's in the process of doing it. Now we realize when Jesus is opening the seals, he doesn't go one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven is just a few minutes after. We know six was in 1963. The other one is just ahead of us somewhere, not too far. And then he goes on to saying, 
that not only is he worthy for the, to be uh, to open the, the book, it's he's worthy on the basis because he had died for our sins. And those in that book is the name of redemption of all the names that he has atoned for. And he has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. You say, well, I've heard that before. Yes, I know you have. But then it says here, when he opens that last one, it says, I beheld and heard a voice of many angels where around the throne. Where are they at located at that time? It's still in glory. He's now opened the seventh seal. And only when he's opened the seventh seal can all of heaven now tell him that he's worthy to receive power. Sorry. So there, in heaven there's ten thousands of saints, a great multitude, and they're all saying, You're worthy, in verse 12, with a loud voice. That kills the silence as far as the mouth silence is concerned. But from the throne position, Every revelation that the bride had since Jesus rose up came from where he was sitting on the throne. Now he's no longer sitting on the throne, but now all revelation that we're going to receive comes from that angelic being that's coming down. Yes, it is first of all the Heavenly Father that imparts this to his Son, and his Son imparts it to an angelic being that's going to be bringing the revelation of what's contained, because his voice cries out in chapter 10, and the seventh thunder is going to sound. So all revelation is no longer from the throne position. Now it's from that angelic being. And that angelic being is an angel. He's an archangel. When we look at Thessalonians, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. Did Jesus come down? It was given to him to open that, to deal with that shout, but it was angel that was ministering it here on the earth. And then when it said, with the voice of the archangel, again, it is Jesus that's sending that archangel down here, and he's going to speak on behalf of Jesus Christ, portraying Jesus Christ. Not only Jesus Christ, because when you see him in Revelation chapter 10, he has that rainbow about him, which is the great eternal spirit, as the angel that is affecting that to you and I here. And when that angel does cry, now we're not going to be looking at seeing an angel, per se, because the angel doesn't necessarily have to appear. He will bring a vision of Jesus Christ to project Jesus Christ to you and I on the earth. But it is an angel. And I must re. Bring back to remembrance again, Hebrew chapter 2, verse 16. Jesus never took on the nature of angels. So it has to be an angel that's characterizing Christ, not Christ characterizing an angel. And I remember in 2005, after Brother Jackson passed away, that was a great big controversy with the brother that's in Indiana, we're in Brother Jackson's church, saying Jesus was that physical angel. Well, here's what would happen if we say that Jesus is that physical angel. Well, okay, maybe we can go back to this one here. If he's that physical angel here, what happens when the rapture comes? If Christ is that angel, he doesn't go to glory to the wedding supper. That angel goes to the Jews for the first half of the week. So therefore, it throws, it's when we try to project that Christ is that actual angel, then you run into, scripture, you run into two problems with two scriptures. Because this is the revelation of the Godhead we're looking at and it's showing how God can use angels. And sometimes we seem to forget from the Old Testament how that in Exodus, God said he had sent an angel. He, when he speaks, you listen to his voice because it was God using to, that angel to speak through to speak to the people. God never came down as an angel. 
He sent that angel. He says, you better listen to his voice and hearken to him, because he will not pardon. All right. So now as that we get to the place, he's opened the seal. And we've been reading here, saying with a loud voice, he's worthy to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. And all that, when that he has broken that seventh seal, he's given the authority. Where is he given the authority? He's still in heaven. Nothing has moved. They're just saying, you're worthy to receive that power. Now watch. The first order of business before he actually comes to you and I. What's, he, what's Jesus going to be doing in the millennium? He's going to be judging the nations, isn't he? So he can function as a judge, as, but his major role is king. So when he receives all power in heaven and earth, the first thing happens, now he's been high priest all throughout here. Now as that seventh seal is broke, he's going to Ro go into the role for a short space of time to be judge. That's where we appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Because he's there not to judge your salvation, but he's there to judge you and I concerning our rewards. And it's just a statement. He's saying he's going to be, he's given that power. Because if he's king, he's He's going to tell those that's going to be in his government before they get into the millennium to start the government. We're not all going to be there on the first day when the millennium starts. Says, well, okay, I forgot to tell you that you're going to be over this city and you're going to be over that city and you might be over here and over there. No, that's done during this half hour or this seventh seal time factor. Now, as he's given that authority, <clears throat> and every creature that which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as in the seas, and all of them that are, are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Now that's just projecting back to where what Jesus had paid for of all those that has died. Some were living, some were in the, drowned in the sea, some were in the, uh, in the different parts, if you want to, in the earth. It's just showing he's really redeeming man, lost mankind. Now... When we come... As like we seen last week. We know that the Antichrist is going to reign, the, the ten horns is going to reign one hour with the beast. That is not a tribute to a man and the time frame for a man. It's referring to a system or a time frame. And we know that to be seven years to begin with. And because of Ezekiel 38 and 39, I know I'm repeating some things, but I want to bring in another side of things this morning. I'm laying a groundwork. As that war is finished, it'll be seven years consecutively of them burying the weapons. And those weapons, they'll be military equipment, modern military equipment. They'll be coming from the different nation that Russia's backing up of all those Muslim countries that has wanted to attack Israel. And God uses his weather, weather maker and that air armada, he knocks it out of the air and weapons and people are strewed all over the place. So they're going to be seven years in cleaning up the land. We won't look at this part here because there's contention saying, well, nobody knows. Well, let's look at it this way. 
somewheres, we have to know when it ends. When will they stop cleaning the weapons? Like I said earlier, it can't be at Armageddon, because the day of the Lord, they're not going to be worried about cleaning weapons. And neither will the, when the middle of the week arrives. Now we're not talking about the woman or the 144,000. We're talking about the Jews that are told through the Torah when that Pope sits in that temple and they start bringing a fuss that brings into view that where he's going to kill the Jews for the word of God. You'll find it in Isaiah 3, chapter 3, verse 25, which is the last verse of that third chapter. And in that verse he talks about an army decimated sitting on the ground. Well, Israel doesn't sit on the ground all throughout here. Hasn't yet. But here they will. Isaiah 4 and 1, which is when you move from the third chapter to the fourth chapter, it tells you the outcome, what that war does. It'll have seven women to one man. And I don't want to preach that message. It's on, on the website. But is Zechariah, the 13th chapter, verse 8, if you read the sixth verse, it puts you when they ask, when did you see the nail scarred in our hands? That's in the first half of the week where they see that. But then it goes on referring to uh, hit, uh, doing, if you, uh, how can I put it? Concerning the shepherd, strike the shepherd and the, the, the flock will flee, so forth. It's referring to like to Jesus, but at the same time, it's what's happening here to the Jews. When the, then the following verse says, and two thirds shall die of that nation. No more will they be able to clean the weapons during that last half of the week then they will be able to clean the weapons after Armageddon. It is not plausible. It's not feasible. It's not the miraculous things. So therefore we know that those seven years ends right around after the middle of that week when he goes to kill those Jews. And two-thirds of ten million is roughly six million. And it fulfills the scripture. They're killed like their fellow brethren were killed in 1945, in World War II. It ended in 1945. So now we have a time frame that we know that if you, this is seven years from the Zika War. Here, I'll make it a little bit bigger. From the Zika War. They'll have seven years to bury, uh, to, sorry, to burn the weapons. That brings you to about a little just after the middle of that seventh week. And we can look back. There's three and a half years there. Time-wise, to go back to Ezekiel 38 and 39 would be another approximately three and a half years. And here's for those that are looking that say it's much shorter here. Now we're going to look at something else this morning. We're looking at the same time frame of the seventh seal time factor or the half hour silence. If this was a, an hour here with a, talking about a system or a time frame, then a half hour is also talking about the time frame of that seventh seal being broken, the events that happens in it which is about, about three and a half years. That's why the scripture said, didn't say it is a half hour. It said it's about a half hour. So it's made that way so we can't figure the actual day or the hour. And that's not the point here this morning. But to show that what we're saying holds water, we're going to go over here and look at it from another perspective. You have Ezekiel 38 and 39. The war is just finished. You had all these countries that came against Israel, which are predominantly Muslim countries, 
backed by Russia, coming against that nation of Israel. Whatever that era modern it comes, God destroys whatever is coming in the land itself. But I want to bring to remembrance in those in 38 and 39, God will call for fire from the Gentile nations to rain on Russia and all those Muslim countries. What is that going to do? Well, let's look at Russia. We know, and this is widely accepted, that when Ezekiel war, the Ezekiel War finishes, Russia will no longer be a major power anymore. To bring Russia down that much, there had to be some destruction in her land to take away her military capability and so forth. Also, as that would be to Russia, to Algeria, Libya, Sudan, uh, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, they're going to be hit as well. Most of those Muslim countries either have dictators or religious leaders in front of it. Their former government is not like a communist or a democratic government. So if you see how that is, as they're set up. Now if God's going to call the Gentile nation to reign on them, to put them down, their government's going to be in a rubble. Just like Russia. And then when it is over, yes, they will have seen gods in it. They will change from the belief of Allah. Now they'll believe in Jehovah. Or at least recognize Jehovah, I'll put it that way. So now, as they're in, their government is in a chaos state. They have to set some government up that can be acceptable for the beast when the week comes. And you don't put up a theocratic government and change it into a democratic or a dictator government into a democratic. It takes people that they can trust to put together to put a form a government and you don't do that in six months. That's why Here, after that war, it's going to take about three and a half years for those governments of the body of the beast to have put something in place, functioning, getting up from the rubble, so they can sign something with the Antichrist for that beast to run in that 70th week. I can see that taken of those countries that have been hit. In order to get a government in place, it'll take them about three, three and a half years. Now remember, the rapture happens here at the beginning of the, just after the beginning of the week. And if you believe that that half hour silence is only a short space of time, then the seven seals for you would not be broken immediately after that war. You'd have to wait a year or two before it's broken after the war. You see where that puts things? Can you see how it's functioning together? So therefore, that's why there, there, there's time needed during that seventh seal time factor. Or you can call it the half hour silence as to a system, not an individual. When we're talking about Jesus in glory as he breaks that seal, we're talking about the individual and people. It's a one short term event. It is, could be about, uh, it says about a half hour. But when you're talking about the effects of that seventh seal, that half hour that for the system now, or the time factor for the seventh seal, for everything that's going to attain in it, for it before the week of Daniel arrives, there's a lot of things take place. If you're looking at it just from the spiritual aspect concerning 
He's off the mercy seat. The angel comes, seven thunders. Oh, that can be short. In your mind, it can be short. But things have to be realistic, as that is, is going to transpire. And if you think it's that short, then you have to look at the other side that has to be a reality. Remember, the Ezekiel War finishes. Those Muslim countries that fought against Israel, that bought Armada, there have been touched and destroyed. So they wouldn't rise up again. N not rise up to come against Israel, but now they have to put a government in place. And for them to put up a government, there's a lot of, a lot of them don't have governmental experience because they've been under dictatorship or so forth. So now there has to be a change in it. They have to make their own laws for their country, whatever they want, whatever <clears throat> they're going to set up for. But then when it comes to the time, it's going to take more than a year or two for them to set up. Look after World War II. The nations that had, and yet some of them didn't have a nation, their government changed. They were occupied by, by the Nazis, by the Germans. It took a while for their government to be set up and their, their, their structure to get up to get functioning as a nation. Didn't mean they have to be full blown what you see today, but at least to be functioning enough that now they're back in place. No, the government didn't disappear. They had to, they had to go hide because the Germans had took over their countries. The Germans had put in their form of government in each one of those countries. Yes, there was resistance. But that's, that's not even close. Because there, they had a government before, and if the, their people weren't killed, then they can put up the government quickly enough. But in Ezekiel 38 and 39, you're not talking about governments like the European governments. You're talking about dictators, despots, and so forth. And you don't put a government structure in that short of a time. How many can see that this morning? So therefore, from there, it would take about three and a half years. About. We don't know how long each country is going to take to come out of the ashes and put a government in form, in, in, in form in place, so that they can, when the week of Daniel does arrive, that the beast. Now, when we talk about the beast, yes. The beast started to appear above the timeline after World War II. And we see the head of Europe. Well, that's just the head of the beast. Yes, there's the ten horns or the ten nations going to be involved in signing with the Antichrist. They're potentially there. But just because you see the head doesn't mean it's the beast. Because the beast can't function without the body. And the body is not in place. It's going through now a turmoil time. But after that two wars, the Miraculous War and the Zika War, then there's going to be a quick change that these nations that have formed the body of the beast now we'll be prepared and have a government that's compatible with the head. And when that pope comes on the scene and says, now I want you to sign a covenant, they won't be doing like the European today. Turkey's trying to get in the EU, but they says because they're not outright saying it, but because of the Muslim belief and, and the instability, they don't want Turkey to join in the EU or other Muslim countries. But after Ezekiel 38, 39, when they have set up, and it takes, like I said, it's going to take a bit of time. And during that time, that time frame is what you call the seventh seal time factor in there. Or that half hour. That's why it'll take about three and a half years. So praise the Lord. In this time frame, again, those nations have to be prepared enough 
to get ready for the signing. But when the ten horns signs, when you're signs with the Antichrist, and when the body, those Arab nation signs with them, now you have the beast, and the beast in its full role does not start before that week of Daniel starts. And when it starts, that old pope doesn't put pressure to participate. But the mark of the beast is enforced when the middle of the week arrives. What triggers it to be enforced? because he's looking at those Jews that had signed a covenant with him in the beginning of the week, because they do sign. And now he sees them causing an uproar because he sits in their temple when he starts to go to slay those Jews. That's where now he, can, he doesn't want any religious element whether it be in Israel or any other country to rise up for any means. And I can see him using them as an example to the world, to the empire. You rise up against our system and the system you have signed for. In the fine prints, it says, neither he that didn't have the mark what not should be killed. He put that in his agreement. That's Revelation chapter 13. So praise the Lord. So now again, as Jesus breaks the seal, yes. What the event that takes place in heaven on human aspects, it can be about half hour or 60 or 30 minutes or whatever the case may be in time frame. But when we're talking about the seventh seal, that all that takes place in it, the time factor for it, or, the, or calling it the half hour silence when we're talking about what's to unroll, then that's more than 30 minutes. That is about three and a half years or three years or so. The reason that we don't know that it, we can't say exactly three and a half years because when the Antichrist sits in the temple, it's not the next day that the war starts, to, he goes after the killing them. As he sees them rising up, as he sees them putting up a, a fight, he has at his disposal, at that time, all the armies of Europe, and all the armies of the beast, of the body of the beast, at his disposal. And that's where he goes slaughtering those Jews. He doesn't stop there. Because now you have your foolish virgins. They see it. And so therefore, the foolish virgin will have enough of the Spirit of God that more or less has been re-energized by the 144,000 goes of those nations saying that's that antichrist system don't take part or you'll be or you'll find yourself in the in a lake of fire at the end result so they are putting up a fuss against his system now he's just dealt with those jews he turns within the territory and he starts slaying jews where we can find them in his territory as well as foolish virgins and no, it is not worldwide. He only kills in a quarter part of the earth. He will not slay here in America because that land beast will have been dealt with. He does not go to South America nor to Australia but he's going to slay where foolish virgins are at 
and where Jews are at in his territory. First of all, yes, Russia is no longer a major power. But the U.S., although she is going to be brought down and no longer a major power either, but not to the extent as Russia has lost, the U.S. will still have those nuclear submarines. For him to come across to attack and submit the foolish virgins in America, it's impossible. First of all, logistic-wise, logistic you have to send some supporting troops and a beachhead to bring your military to bear arms in a country you're going to take. You t look at America when they went into the Gulf War in 1991. It took them a month or two to bring the weapons near Saudi Arabia and other nations where they could actually make and go against Saddam Hussein. So therefore, but what's going to happen, Brother Fred, about the foolish virgins that are here in America? Do they all have to be slaughtered? No. But they will wake up. And as the foolish virgin wakes up here, the foolish virgins are going to wake up over there because the woman is coming back to America. And the 104,000 is in the territory of the beast. As the foolish virgin are woken up by the servants, I can see the woman Israel now causing the foolish virgin to uprise in America as well. The whatever God causes for America to be dealt with, however it's going to play out, we're looking at the George Washington vision. That George Washington vision, well, the first one was the independent war of independence. The second one was the Civil War. And this third one will no, more likely be a civil war as well. Why do you think you're seeing a rising in America now? The polarization of groups. They fought in the streets. But it's a spirit of Satan agitating this. In the last 40 years, it's been getting worse. It's been held and suppressed for a while, but now it's starting to pop up. Everybody wants their rights. Everybody don't want, don't want to be shamed. They want to change history. They talked about the statue of Robert E. Lee. Well, we got the same thing here going on in Canada. They want to change the name of John A. McDonald off of some of these boarding houses. If it's history, it's history. You can't erase history and say they never existed. Accept what happened. It seems like people don't want to accept reality. Only thing that's good for them. What kind of world are we living in? Things could happen here in Canada. Usually there's a cause and effect. Whatever takes place in America somehow comes rolling over into Canada. It's just that we've been, a, yes, a more peaceful type nation, but let the right triggers take place, and you'll see the same spirits of different groups going at each other, just as it is in the US. It's a current that's running underground. It's what, what's the, really the main cause of them of this hatred and, and, and it flaring up. They try to blame this and that and the other thing. But when Satan started dealing with the governments, and the government started saying, well, we need more revenue. They didn't put it out this way. But it'd be good that the woman in the house would work to support a better income so you can have a better life. And that sounded so good. And they went for it, hook, line, and sinker. But what they didn't realize, as both of them working, 
Most of the time the children were left unattended and Satan had that old thing called that television that they become no longer have morals or how to look at things and deal with things. It's whatever they think of themselves and me, me, me and you look at a spoiled brat, that's what he's like. He doesn't want to care about what you think. And so therefore we have a over time, one or two generations that's come up that has now grown up. Hey, that's offensive to me. Take that out of there. We don't like it. Don't have enough morals to, to say that's history. It's not going to hurt you that being there. And if that offends you, that means you've got a spirit on you that you are biased. You see where this is going? We're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Because something somewhere has to come down the road as well to not just America, but the Canada as well. Something to flare up as well that causes such a division. And I feel that it would be more likely a civil war again in that George Washington vision. And you've got a polarization in America. The two coasts, they're Democratic. In the middle, the Republican. They're not better than one another. But they're so blinded. You can see it in the spirit in, the, in their politics and well as in ours. They'll go at all costs, leaving all moral ways of living to defeat, to decay, to uncharacterize their opponent to bring them down using all kinds of dirt instead of using a platform. Now I'm getting into politics, right? They don't care about the platform. It's whatever dirt you can bring to bring the other fella down so you can be elected. And once the government is set up, they're not looking to help you and I. It's to score points against the other fella. So we can get in power. Shameful. How did it get to the point they were arguing like that? I remember when I was young, the government didn't act that way. Well, we didn't have TV that was on them all the time. But at least they didn't go to, to such low realms to get elected. At least they had some principles. They weren't saints by any mean. Now, don't give me that. But it's grown a whole lot worse since the 60s of what we find now. And if we sometime would know what was happening behind the scenes, there would be even worse things take place. So that's the hour we're living in. But getting back, yes, that half hour silence, when we're talking about events, it's about three and a half years. And whether you call it that half hour silence up for the events, as far as events is concerned, not when the silence is in heaven I'm talking about. Or you can say it, I'm going to use the terminology now, it's a seventh seal time factor. What happens? There's a time factor to that seventh seal. Because when the seventh seal is over, you're in the week of Daniel. When does the bride go up? Just when that seventh, when the week of Daniel is about ready to go. So therefore, the effects of that seventh seal starts with Jesus opening that seal to begin with. Yes, in heaven he's received authority that he's going to be king. Well, he's going to receive power, blessings, and so forth. That's in, given unto him. So his first function, he receives that in heaven. Once he receives that in heaven, now he will send that angel after that has been said to him down to the earth. And that's where Luke chapter 19, verse 15 comes into place. 
It says, and when he was come, came to the earth, having past tense received the authority. Now you tell me when did he get the authority? The angel comes down first and then he gets the authority after. He received it in glory. So when that seventh seal is peeled, the next action, they're saying, you're worthy to have all the power and glory. He now, that angel is dispatched, that, that archangel to the earth, which is going to characterize Christ, not Christ characterizing the angel. And he says, once he's here in that 15th verse of, chapter, of Luke chapter 19, he says, when he was here on the earth, now, then, if you want to, having received past tense, not future, he's already received the authority for it. And what's the, and this is then, while here on the earth, brings the servants to do what? He's acting on that authority to choose to tell the recipient that are alive, uh, that are alive on the earth to the bride saints that has gone in there, you were, you were faithful over one, so therefore you'll, be, you'll reign over 10 cities. You have gained from one pound to 10 pounds, so therefore you will be reigning over 10 cities. He's starting to set up to tell those that's gonna be in the rulership what they're going to receive. Now while that angel that is characterizing Christ, telling that on the earth to the living element, the literal Lord Jesus Christ, he's up in glory. He's doing that to the deceased saints. And if you don't believe this, then why is Jesus up there doing nothing and sending an angel down here? Did he take a vacation, time off, because he worked for 2,000 years for the grace age, or over 2,000 years? No, he's busy judging, using, he has the authority now to judge them. Because the authority is to judge them in their respect, judging them for their position for the millennium. Well, praise the Lord. The more we look at this picture, the more, the more we can see it fitting into place. That's why this is, yes, as far as that angel coming and dealing with the earthly recipients, he's going to judge the quick. That's what he's doing. The angel judging the quick. The literal Lord Jesus Christ is judging the deceased bride in heaven. And they're a great multitude. Well, where'd you get that great multitude? Well, it's in Revelation chapter 19. And in Revelation chapter 19, it says... In verse 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, not a few bride saints, a great multitude, as the voice of many waters. Now there's quite a crowd of bride saints. This is pertaining to the bride saints, by the way. The voice of many waters, as the voice of, the, of a mighty thundering saying, Hallelujah, the Lord omnipotent reigns. Now it's speaking in the term that multitude is finished. Now it goes into verse 7. It says, Let us rejoice and give honor to Him for the marriage of the Lamb is come. So when is the marriage? The rapture is the marriage. You're not married at the wedding supper and you're not married prior to, to the time of the, before the rapture, because we're going to have a resurrected, body, have to res, a resurrected body like him, that's where the marriage takes place. And his wife has, past tense, see, made herself ready. Well, if the wife has already made herself ready, which talks about the bride for the, all the, the grace age, that's why verse 6 says it's a great multitude saying these things. It's the bride multitude. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Blessed are they that are called to the marriage supper uh, of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And it's funny, right after that, it talks about 
that the testimony of Jesus and the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's what made the bride ready in this hour. From 1963, he will show you things to come. He didn't say he's going to show you things till Brother Brian come or till Brother Jackson come. But even in this third watch during the fivefold ministry, this revelation to come. And God has, the Lord has opened some already. Because if you only see that you, don't, you can't see anything beyond Brother Jackson, I'd have to say you're running in circles. Just like the Brandon movement ran in circles. Well, maybe I've said enough for this morning. But can you see the picture? When we talk about that half hour silence, you have to also look at the same time. Those countries that have been devastated after Ezekiel War to be established for signing the covenant. Well, what makes you say it's that much time? Well, what makes you say that it's only a very short time then? That goes hand in hand. One is what's happening on the earth, and the other one shows what's happening spiritually speaking with the bride. So both are working hand in hand. I realize maybe I didn't expound things like a, I should, but then you're limited. You do can only do what you only can do, so praise the Lord. I had a good time with looking at it during the week, and I thought, my, this is gonna be great, but Sometimes you can only present what it is. It's what allows, allows you to, to speak. So again, that half hour silence, you can also call it the seven seal time factor, a period of time. And so therefore it is, by what we said this morning, around three and a half years. Because what, what pinpoints it more accurately is Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 9, there'll be seven years in burning the weapons. So therefore, if you f know when it ends, and you look back seven years, well, there's three and a half that we'll have for the first half of the week, then you got three and a half to go back to Ezekiel war. Well, that means it, there's about that much, because it's not right the middle of the week, the minute the, it's right here, three and a half years uh, to the day to the hour that the war takes place there. It may take three, six months, whatever the enterprise goes after them. So it is about. So therefore, that would be about also concerning the gap between the war of Ezekiel 38, 39 and the opening of the week. So there's three, about three and a half year here and three and a half years here, which makes seven years of burning the weapons. And burning those weapons, they won't be doing it after the middle of the week. They're running for their lives. <laughs> no more than you can try to put that in Armageddon. In the day of the Lord, they'll be running for their lives. They're not going to be burning up and cleaning up the weapons. So there we go. Praise the Lord. As broken as it is, I pray that you have... I'm not talking to babes anymore. Surely the bride has grown up and has enough understanding what the Lord is doing in this hour. Yes, there's a new one, but God will give time for those to come into the picture. You don't get everything overnight. And why do we use charts? If I was preaching basic salvation, I wouldn't need a chart at all. But when you're talking about complicated events, in order to stay focused, you need to see something. All right, let's just stand. Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of service, Lord, let's take the words that's broken as they were, use it as see fit, Lord, I pray. Lord, we know that the things that you have given to us, Lord, that we can see a picture here at the end time. And Lord, bless my brothers and sisters, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. I have the musicians to come and someone has a need. In the meantime, you're welcome to come. Praise the Lord.
when he reached down his hand for me. When he reached down his hand for me. I was lost and undone without God for his son. Let's all stand at this time. Brother Elijah, if you'd dismiss in a word of prayer this morning. Be fire, Lord, Lord. <coughs> 